today we will give us a keynote on WHO management, integrate management of shield wood illness and shield health. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me for this talk. Um, this is going to be uh, a talk based on two components. First will be the IMCI and the updates the IMCI has uh, been undertaken for the past many years because, as you know, IMCI has been there for 20 years now. It was launched in 1997. So I'll briefly go through just 2005, 2008, 2012 uh, updates, but I'll spend a little bit more time on the new update which will be coming this year on young infants uh, less than two months old. And after that, I'll take a few minutes to describe a little bit of what is going on in the WHO, UNICEF, and other partners who are working on what they are calling as Child Health Redesign. It's a project name, but it's, it's what they are calling it, and that's what they are working on now. So MCI updates actually are needed off and on because uh, it's been there for 20 years and every couple of years or so new evidence becomes available, new guidelines are produced, new recommendations are made, and those have to be included. Epidemiology changes, you know, when we started with IMCI at that time, the pneumonia and diarrhea mortality was in millions, still is very high, but now the newborn mortality is proportionately much higher than, than, than as far as under five um, old mortality is concerned. And we also need to look at how we can basically train people on IMCI. Er earlier courses were 11 days, then people have experimented with distance learning, with ICAT, with five days, six days, seven days, and so on. So the 2005 IMCI update was the first update. It covered six areas, the respiratory infections, low osmolarity, ORS was introduced, zinc was introduced in that, and then the treatment of malaria with ACTs was also introduced at that time. In 2008, it was primarily, you know, the young infant which was uh, revised in a way that young infant at that time had 16 signs to identify a sick child, a sick young infant. So that was reduced to seven signs based on the research which was conducted in several countries at that time, and that this, those seven signs would basically have the same sensitivity or specificity around that as you would have 16 signs. The 16 signs had a lot of signs which were very, very rare. And at first, the first time HIV section was introduced in IMCI for countries which had, uh, you know, high proportion of HIV cases. In 2012, a major update also happened. Uh, along with the IMCI, the pocket book was also revised, and uh, it basically had several sections which were revised, danger signs, uh, cough or difficult breathing, diarrhea, fever, measles, ear problems, malnutrition, anemia, HIV infections. Uh, there isn't enough time to go through all of them. I'll just enumerating all that. But I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this new uh, update which is going to take place uh, hopefully this year we will have new component of zero to two months old, which we WHO calls uh, young infants. Now, all of you have probably seen the pie chart, which is very famous, which shows that prematurity causes 31% of neonatal deaths, uh, asphyxia causes 27% of neonatal deaths, and neck infections cause about you know, 23% of neonatal deaths. Most of them are based on estimates because the vital registration data is available from some countries and not all countries. 
So those estimates show those things. But recently, a study was published which was pr prospectively done in 11 countries, and it showed interestingly that the neonatal infections are much more common than previously recognized. And as you can see here, in sub-Saharan Africa, there are 37% of all neonatal deaths. And in South Asia, 35% of non-neonatal deaths. More than the preterm births and a little less than perinatal asphyxia. So this was published in December um, last year, which shows that neonatal infections are being underestimated in a number of places. Now currently we know that to diagnose neonatal infection, we use clinical signs. There is hardly a test which can recognize neonatal infection. Obviously, blood cultures and other things are done, but in very few cases, blood culture comes positive. Recently, you have, must have seen uh, last year, ANISA study was published, a huge effort from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, but the blood culture's positivity was extremely low. And even though they did all kinds of sophisticated tests. They could identify uh, you know, um, etiology in a proportion of children who were clinically assessed as having uh, sepsis. In this included viruses, included bacteria, et cetera. But even then, it was about 60% plus. But in ordinary public health settings, we don't have the luxury of doing any of those tests. In research studies, you can do that, but in public health settings, you don't. And when you diagnose that, then you say, okay, go to the hospital, get injectable treatment there or supportive therapy there. Unfortunately, very few families take the children to the hospital, about 25%, because of either economic reasons, distance, or they're not sure of the quality. Sometimes they're, you know, uh, the things are so far away that they can't really go over there. So WHO was facing this dilemma for past many, many years, and people were asking, what do we do about these children who don't go to the hospital? So WHO led research which was uh, conducted in several countries, trying to find whether we could identify a deliverable effective treatment in young infants who are seriously sick and who are unable to go to the hospitals, where referral is not possible. So three randomized control trials were conducted, one in Bangladesh, one in Pakistan, and one in DRC, Congo, Nigeria, and Kenya. They all had similar research questions, similar outcomes, similar. So somebody was saying that it's difficult to to really have the same definitions, et cetera, and different sites. But luckily, we were able to do that here in, in these, these trials. And this was a very, very large effort. Two were published in Dancet and two were published in Lancet in Global Health. And WHO came up with a guideline in 2015 for managing of possible serious bacterial infection when referral was not feasible. So the three things which came out of these guidelines, which I would like to highlight, first was that children who are 7 to 59 days old did not need referral to the hospital. They could be treated with oral amoxicillin for seven days. And this was a result of one of the largest trials which was done on this, uh, these, these uh, possible serious bacterial infection. Now previously, IMCI was recommending that all young infants should be referred to the hospital. Any sick child who is less than two months old when it comes to the first level facility or somewhere needs to go to the hospital. This is the first time about 40% of those children who only have fast breathing or between seven to 59 days are being recommended to be treated on an outpatient basis with oral amoxicillin. So this is a huge change in that sense. And hopefully, the IMCI, the revised IMCI will be launched within next two, three months. The guideline was launched in 2015. But obviously, translating a guideline into tool also takes some time. All other children who are sick are referred. But the problem is, like I said, only 25% accept referral. 
So what to do with 75%? So of those 75%, a lot of children are not very, very sick. They're not critically ill. They're not unconscious. They don't have convulsions. They don't have sepsis in a way that they can't drink, they can't eat, they can't move, etc. So there is an in-between place where child only has some fever, some low temperature, or has difficulty in feeding, has lower chest in drawing, or is moving a little bit less than normal, etc. So those children then can be treated with oral antibiotic plus injectable gentamicin on an outpatient basis. So this recommendation came in 2015. So the potentially, the IMCI algorithm which we'll be looking uh, and will be launched very soon, that all sick young infants need to be recognized by family or by health workers during home visits. Only children 7 to 59 days of age with only fast breathing can be treated outpatient. They don't need any referral. Others need referral. But if referral is not accepted, infants with PSPIE reclassified, those who are less than seven days old with fast breathing, and those who are up to two months with clinical severe infection, the five signs which I mentioned briefly, they could be treated with simplified antibiotics regimen consisting of oral amoxicillin plus gentamicin on an outpatient basis. So this is a totally a radical thing coming from, you know, WHO guidelines, because sub, such newborns are not never treated on an outpatient basis with OPD on OPD. Now, critically ill children who are, you know, really very sick and moribund, they are basically asked to go to the hospital. Unfortunately, many of those children also don't go to the hospitals. So in that case, the guidelines review group recommended that those children should be given at least once daily injectable gentamicin plus twice daily injectable ampicillin for seven days. Because this is the only thing which is probably possible at an outpatient setting in a first level health facility in low resource settings because these families refuse to go to the hospital. So the new implementation strategy which will be coming out soon is basically improved identification of these six young infants, treatment of fast breathing, a large number with outpatient therapy, improved referral to the hospitals, because you know hospitals are also uh, need to be there as far as for some children are concerned. And if referral is not possible, providing them with simplified antibiotic regimens on an outpatient basis. Now, EFRI-NEST and SAT studies, which I showed you, the four studies, were done in a very large population, about three million population. But they were not implemented in the health system. Only India and Ethiopia had policy that when such sick children who are young infants cannot go to a hospital, they should be treated in the first level facility. In India, it was recommended that they should be treated by auxiliary midwife nurse. And in Ethiopia, it was the health extension worker who was supposed to treat them. Unfortunately, not many children were treated over there also, despite the policy. And then there were other countries who said, you know, we want some implementation experience of this guidelines. How can we introduce this guideline, which requires a health worker at the first level facility with injectable therapy? We have never done this before. We need more research. So then WHO and other partners, we led implementation research to bridge the scale up which we are expecting after that. Now, what is the problem with the scale up of this intervention? One is the high risk population. Children who are not treated have a mortality of 15%. Even with treatment, they are 2% die. We know that. Complex intervention, injections plus oral antibiotics. In India and in Ethiopia, in India hardly anybody was treating in despite the policy because the doctors were not treating such, such six young children in first level facility. Why should have another health worker which is lower than doctors should treat? 
They didn't want to take the risk. Ethiopia, they were providing medicines, but very few children actually treated in those, you know, what they call as uh, the health centers. It was essential to have technical backup and support to provide to these workers who were working at the first level facility to, to basically somebody be there, okay, we are there for, to help you and to guide you, to train you, to monitor things, to provide quality of care, etc. So in order to establish that implementation research, WHO held orientation and policy dialogue meetings in many countries. So in this exercise, seven countries were involved, three in Asia and four in Africa, as you can see here. Large countries, most of them. Informed decisions were taken on treatment choices in that, you know, this, uh, this dialogue was between Ministry of Health people, experts, technical experts, pediatricians, neonatologists, program managers, and also NGOs and others. Who will treat, when they will treat, how they will treat, where we will treat. These decisions were taken at, at that country level. And these implementation research sites were chosen, about 13 different sites in seven different countries. Some countries more than one site. All these studies in other countries have been completed. India is still continuing to enroll patients, and hopefully by March this year, they will also complete that study. Shelley, who is sitting here, is one of the sites in India which is doing this implementation research. Building capacity and creating a learning platform in the shape of technical support units. So the academic institutions in those places or research-based NGOs were given the task of providing that technical support. So they would, implementation would be done by the program managers, district people, but the technical support in the shape of training, supervision, quality control, and hand-holding, problem-solving, this was done by the technical support units. So Shelly's group is one of the technical support units in India for Lucknow. They are doing it in four blocks in a population of 200,000? 200,000. So this, but this was the, you know, a large number of study sites, basically. 13 sites in seven countries. Now, in 2012, Seal et al. published a meta-analysis on possible serious bacterial infection from Southeast Asia and also from Africa and some Latin American countries. They showed that the PSBI, possible serious bacterial infection risk, was 7.6%, and nearly 6 million children were suffering from this problem every year in this, you know, Africa and Asia. They found case fatality rate to be 9.6%, but that included both prospective and retrospective studies. For prospective studies, it was only 7%. And in most of these studies, patients were referred to the hospital, but a large number did not go. Now, the data which has become available from these implementation research sites, up till now, nearly you know, 5,807 patients have been identified and treated. And where referral was not possible, they were also treated at the outpatient facility. If we were to use Seal et al's estimate of 7% case fatality rate, we would expect 406 deaths. Whereas with the new strategy, there were only 2% deaths, 116 deaths. It's 290 young infants who would have died if there was no provision of simplified regimens at outpatient facility would have occurred more. So those 290 deaths were actually saved in this, this kind of, this population where implementation research was conducted. So preliminary impact for life saved of 6 million cases with 75% cover, percent coverage, which was the case in this implementation research studies, we would probably be able to save 225,000 young infants with sepsis every year. With 100% coverage, probably 300,000. These are optimistic estimates, but even then, nearly 500,000 young infants are dying every year with sepsis. So in that sense, it's a pretty good intervention. 
and surely people can talk to her how things have changed in their site. Uh, so hopefully we will get this IMCI update in the next uh, few months. The second part of my presentation is about child health redesign. It's a complex thing, but I'll try to walk myself through and also your son with it. A couple of years ago, there was a strategic review of IMNCI because people were, some people were not very happy with IMNCI. There have been some you know, other challenges which we have faced, which I'll go through with you. Positive effects of IMCI has been there, you know, as far as the healthcare worker practices are concerned, quality of care is concerned. Where it has been implemented well, it has reduced mortality. You know, Cochrane uh, review was also done, and randomized control trials have been done. It is perceived as holistic and child-centered. It addresses major causes of death, which are, you know, uh, there in most of the low and middle-income countries. But the strategic review also found some other things. There has been global fragmentation of child health strategies. You know, now we have Gavi, we have Global Fund, we have other things. So the competition for limited resources is there. So there is no basically champion for child health as such. So there are programs for diseases, but when you talk of child health or adolescent health, those champions actually don't exist. So that has led to difficulty in programming and also limited success. Accountability is needed for clear program targets. IMCI does not have any targets. EPI has targets. Malaria has targets. TB has targets. But IMCI does not have targets. So that is basically needed to say that, okay, you did this, and this is the effect which you had. The strategies also need to be sufficiently tailored to country context. Currently, we have only one kind of IMCI, which is generic, which is modified or adapted by countries to when they're working on their own systems. We need more funding also for child health and these kind of things. So we, nobody will achieve the SDG goals if adequate funding is not available and especially delivery to marginalized population with conflicts, with, you know, asylum seekers, refugees. It's a, it's a totally different kind of work nowadays. No more IMCI can be used in just one static first level facility. So you need to have more activities. So why do we need this redesign? MDGs have been completed. Now in the, we are in the era of uh, SDGs, which do not have specific child health goals, but you know they had sustainable development goals, a lot of them. Universal health coverage is now there. Revitalized primary health care is there. Secretary General, UN Secretary General's strategy for MNCH is also there. Epidemiology has also changed. Vaccines, Dr. Mabey was telling us, pneumococcal vaccine is there. Hip vaccine is there. So what is causing pneumonia nowadays? How it is going to change? Other serotypes, etc. Disease burdens are changing. Neonates are becoming, neonatal deaths are becoming more in as far as the overall child health deaths are concerned. We also need greater emphasis on health determinants requiring more community engagement. Up till now, we have been working with just health facilities. Communities have not really been involved in that and beyond the health sector. This publication in 2014 showed that investments in health sector only resulted in 50% of the deaths reduction <coughs> since 1990 in lower middle income countries. 50% of the deaths were due to investment in other sectors, housing, education, and other things. So health per se, and investment in health per se, would only have 50% of impact. Every year, there are new scientific evidence coming up, clinical interventions, delivery strategies, new technologies are coming up all the time. Sorry. Vaccines, diagnostics, treatment innovations, M-Health, E-Health. 
people are also asking for demand content that responds to changing country context. People, some Latin American countries are saying, well, pneumonia and diarrhea, bacterial pneumonia, and bacterial diarrhea is no more there. Most of us are RSV now. What do you do with children who have hypoxemia and RSV? So we need some harmonized and optimized context, but also flexible and adaptable to country context. And sometimes in some national level also, we need to have some changes. So when they were redesigning this and conceptualizing this new child health thing, one thing which came clear was that up till now, MCI has focused on under five-year-old children. But the definition of child now is up to 18 years. The SDGs are talking about 18 years. So we need to have you know, a child who is toddler then up to the adolescent health. Refocus and prioritize child survival agenda. Who are the, which age groups are most vulnerable? Is less than two years more vulnerable? New neurons are more vulnerable? Even adolescents are dying of diarrhea and pneumonia. So leading causes of mortality target age groups. So these systematic reviews, et cetera, have been conducted on that. Define priorities and address emerging child health priorities. Development, early childhood development, preschool development, and those kind of things. Define, prioritize, and mainstream thrive agenda. Up till now, I'm saying I was talking about mostly about sick children. But now, we we'll say, OK, you need to talk about other children also who are healthy, who need other interventions. They may not be medical interventions, but you need other interventions. What interventions? Which interventions? When? How? Harmonize and mainstream, you know, three, promote, prevent, and treat. Promote, for example, breastfeeding. Prevent, for example, immunization. Treat when you get sick. But not all children are sick. Some are having problems with nutrition. Some are having just other problems. So guidance is also needed for you know, flexibility and adaptability for different contexts. Within the same country, India is such a big country. One state will require something else. The other state will require something else. UP will require something else. Bihar will require something else. Whereas Tamil Nadu will say, OK, this is not for us. We need something else. So the conceptual framework, I'm basically to my last slide now. So the vision is having universal health coverage for children 0 to 18 years in the era of sustainable development goals. So we'll be there talking about from 0 to 18 years. Survival is still remain a main component. And within that survive, IMCI is not going to disappear. So IMCI will remain as a core component. But you know, kangaroo mother care is another intervention which has shown a lot of reduction in neonatal mortality. ICCM, which is Integrated Community Case Management, vaccines, revitalize THC. To prevent injuries, injuries is a huge problem in older children. Road safety, drowning, prevent self-harm and HIV, etc. in adolescents, suicides in adolescents, depression. Thrive, looking after the healthy children also, healthy adolescents also. Early child development, school-based interventions, peer and social interventions. And then transform, transform, you know, basically other sectors the role which they will play. For example, housing which is needed for a child to have good health. Wash, water, sanitation, etc. Environmental pollution. Indoor air pollution leads to low birth weights, pneumonia incidence which is high, etc. Road safety to prevent injuries and accidents. So these are not health interventions. These are interventions which are outside the health sector. Prevent, promote, it goes all along and same, similarly delay diversity of settings. We need interventions for households, for first level facilities, for second level facilities, for hospitals, for schools. Age appropriate nutrition interventions. Malnutrition is you know, increasing. In some places it has doubled. And then goal is basically to optimally have healthy 
a properly educated child, socially prepared for adulthood. It's a mouthful. It's also very ambitious. But that is where WHO and partners want to go now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Maybe and Dr. Kasi for these uh, two keynote lectures, understanding the landscape of fever with Dr. Maybe and Dr. Kasi with this excellent, uh, you know,